Steel is an alloy of iron and carbon containing less than 2% carbon, 1% manganese, and small amounts of silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, and oxygen. It is one of the most essential materials in the world. It is vital to every aspect of our lives, from infrastructure and transport to surgical tools and household articles. With steel, we can create huge buildings, such as skyscrapers, or tiny parts for precision engineering equipment. It is a strong, versatile, and permanent material that can be recycled over and over again without losing any of its properties. There are more than 3,500 different grades of steel with many different physical, chemical, and environmental properties. In this video, we will look at the various discoveries and inventions that occur in the production of this world's greatest alloy from ancient times to this day. Welcome to the channel, endeavor to watch the video till the end, and if you find the video useful, please like and share the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on the notification icon for more content. The history of steel production can be traced back almost 4000 years to the start of the Iron Age. When the Hittites of Anatolia and the Chalibis of the Black Sea began smelting iron around 2000 to 1500 BC. They produce iron in small shaft furnaces as solid lumps or spongy masses called blooms, and then hot forged into bars of wrought iron, a malleable material containing bits of slag and charcoal. The Chalibis and Hittites wrought iron contained only 0.8% carbon, so it did not have the tensile strength of steel. The Chinese made a transition from the production of low-carbon iron to high-carbon iron. Around 500 BC, Chinese metal workers built a 7-foot-tall furnace to burn large quantities of iron and wood. At very high temperatures, iron absorbs carbon, which lowers the melting point of the metal resulting in cast iron that contains 2-4% carbon, which is then poured into molds that take the shapes of statue and cooking tools. The Chinese cast iron with 2-4% carbon was more brittle than steel. The brittleness due to its high carbon content made it not ideal for working and shaping. Neither the Hittites wrought iron nor the Chinese cast iron was the perfect mixture as they are not steel. The Chalibis of the Black Sea moved one step closer to fabricating the desired metal by putting iron bars into piles of white-hot charcoal, which produced steel-coated wrought iron. Around 400 BC, Indian metal workers were able to get the perfect ratio of carbon to iron. They did this by sealing iron and charcoal into clay crucibles and roasting them at extremely high temperatures in the furnace to produce ingots of pure steel, which they called wood steel, a material that is still admired today for its quality. The steel was extremely tough, resistant to shatter, and could be honed to the sharpest edge. The Syrians used the metal to forge the famous Damascus steel sword, the true nature of the Damascus or wood steel and how it was made intrigued metal workers and scholars in Asia and Europe for a long period. The use of high carbon alloys was little known in Europe. Therefore, the research into wood steel played an important role in the development of modern steelmaking. Metal workers in Europe began to produce steel by converting wrought iron into steel using this cementation process. The wrought iron bars are layered in powdered charcoal and heated for a long period to increase the carbon content in the wrought iron. Repeated heating would distribute carbon more evenly. During the reheating process, carbon monoxide gas was formed internally at the non-metallic inclusions. Because of that, blisters are formed on the surface of the steel. Hence, the product is called blister steel. The higher carbon content made blister steel much more workable than pig iron allowing it to be pressed or rolled. By the 18th century, steel was becoming widely renowned as an extremely valuable material with many uses. However, it was still quite expensive to make and was produced in limited quantities for special applications like armor, tools, and weaponry. In the 1740s, two decades before the first industrial revolution, an improvement was made in the production of steel. Benjamin Huntsman developed his crucible steel technique a process quite similar to the ancient Indian method of using clay crucibles. Using a clay pot called a crucible, he was able to achieve temperatures high enough to melt the blister steel produced in the cementation process and pour the resulting liquid to create steel ingots of uniformly high quality. The ingot that emerged from the smelter was more uniform, stronger, and less brittle than at the time. Sheffield, England, became the center of crucible steel production. 
As the Industrial Revolution progressed, so did the demand for iron and steel. Wrought iron, which was the only material available in sufficient quantities were produced in small batches. Henry Cork developed two innovative techniques to meet these needs, patented in 1783 and 1784. The first one was improving the quality of pig iron by stirring the molten melt in a puddling furnace. This reduced the carbon content, so the metal was tougher and less brittle. The second innovative technique was that he invented the steel roller for steel manufacturing, which further added to the metal's strength. His innovations paved the way for industrial-scale rolling mills and the creation of sheet iron and steel for new applications such as the building of ships. Before the Second Industrial Revolution in the 1860s, steel was still an expensive product made in small quantities and used mostly for swords, tools, and cutlery. All large metal structures were made of wrought or cast iron. The problem of mass producing cheap steel was solved in 1855 by Henry Bessemer, with the introduction of the Bessemer converter in Sheffield, England. Bessemer designed a pear-shaped crucible lined with a refractory material containing silica, referred to as a converter, in which iron could be heated while oxygen could be blown through the molten metal. A similar process is said to have been used in the United States by William Kelly in 1851, but it was not patented until 1857. In the Bessemer process, molten pig iron was charged into a large crucible and air was blown through the molten iron from below. The air reacted with impurities such as manganese, causing them to oxidize and also igniting the dissolved carbon from the coke. As the carbon burned off, the melting point of the mixture increased, but the heat from the burning carbon provided the extra energy needed to keep the mixture molten. The process was fast and inexpensive. A typical converter could convert a 25-ton batch of pig iron to steel in 30 minutes. One major disadvantage of the Bessemer process was that it could only convert pig iron containing low phosphorus. It turned out that Bessemer had used iron ores containing very little phosphorus, while most iron ore deposits were rich in phosphorus. The presence of phosphorus made his steel product brittle. As a result, only ores free from phosphorus could be used. In 1876, a young Britishman Sidney Gilchrist Thomas found a solution to the phosphorus problem. Thomas discovered that by adding a basic flux such as lime to the Bessemer process, the lime draws phosphorus from the pig iron into the slag, allowing the unwanted element to be removed. But the basic slag produced will have worn down the acidic refractory lining of the converter, so he replaced the acidic lining with a basic lining. In 1878, together with Percy Gilchrist, they developed a basic line converter in which calcined dolomite was the refractory material. In the 1860s, German engineer Carl Wilhelm Siemens further improved the quality of steel production by developing the Siemens regenerative furnace. French engineer Pierre-Emile Martin applied the process to steelmaking. This furnace is popularly known as the Open Hearth Furnace or Siemens Martin Furnace. This furnace operates at a high temperature by using regenerative preheating of fuel and air for combustion. The exhaust gases from the furnace are pumped into a chamber containing bricks, where heat is transferred from the gases to the bricks to maintain a high temperature that is used to melt the charge. The advantage of the open hearth steel making was its flexibility. The metal charge could be molten pig iron, scrap steel or a combination of the two. Its disadvantage is that it is a slow process of manufacturing steel. This drawback is also an advantage because it gives metallurgists enough time to analyze and control the quality of the metal during the refining process resulting in stronger grades of steel. With a better understanding of the properties of steel, steel alloys became more widespread. By 1900, the open hearth process had primarily replaced the Bessemer process. In the mid-20th century, a Swiss engineer named Robert Durr experimented with the Bessemer process and discovered a better way to produce high-quality steel faster. He blasted pure oxygen into the furnace, instead of air that contains only 20% of oxygen, he found out that it removed carbon from the molten iron more effectively. The process was further developed by an Austrian company, Voest, which is presently known as Vostalpine. The process is called the Basic Oxygen Process or the linz donowitz Process, named after the Austrian town where it was first commercialized. The Basic Oxygen Furnace Process combines the advantages of both the Bessemer Process and the Open Hearth Process. 
The process blow oxygen into large quantities of molten iron and scrap steel through a lance from the top of the pear-shaped vessel similar to a Bessemer converter. The process is fast and can complete a charge much more quickly than the open hearth process. Thanks to Dura's innovation, producing high-quality steel became cheaper yet again. With increased growth in electric power generation towards the end of the 19th century, it became possible to contemplate the use of electricity as an energy source for steelmaking. Paul Heroltz, coming from France, developed the first electric arc furnace and established a commercial plant in the United States in 1907. The electric arc furnace was designed to pass an electric current through charged materials. A three-phase graphite electrode is connected to an electric supply and then lowered into the charge, striking an arc, thereby generating high enough temperatures to melt the scrap. Unlike the basic oxygen furnace, the electric arc furnace is not limited to hot metal. It can be fed with cold or preheated scrap steel, a mixture of scrap and pig iron, or only pig iron. Steel of excellent quality with low sulfur and phosphorus content can be produced. For this reason, the production of steel using the electric arc furnace has been increasing and now accounts for more than 30% of global steel production. With the need for improved properties in steel, alloying elements are added to steel to improve specific properties such as strength, wear, and corrosion resistance. In 1912, a British metallurgist named Harry Brearley was looking for a way to preserve the life of gun barrels. While experimenting with chromium and steel alloys, he found out that steel with a layer of chromium was resistant to acid and weathering. He called it rustless steel but his friend marketed it under the name stainless steel. The steel had a composition of 13% chromium and 0.4% carbon. Today, steelmakers know how to combine the exact mix of iron, carbon, and other alloying elements to produce different grades or types of steel. The significant developments and innovations made in steelmaking processes that saw production shift from a focus on weapons to infrastructure and transport with other things, made steel the world's greatest alloy, and thanks to the superior characteristics of steel material, its ability to be recycled without losing its properties, and economic mass production, it will continue to be an integral part of our lives for many more centuries to come.